Okay, while I finished with all the modeling workflow videos for Blender, it's time to jump over to Substance Painter and start talking about texturing techniques for weapons artists. And I'm real excited to talk about this because for me, the texturing part is probably the funnest step in the asset creation process. Now, my favorite texturing application is Substance Painter, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. It's really very affordable, but if you're interested in just trying it, they offer a 30-day trial period on all their software. So this is going to be more of an intermediate topic aimed at those who already know how to navigate their way through Substance Painter. I'm going to be going over some of the tools and techniques that I find helpful when it comes to texturing a weapons model for a video game. We'll talk some about material design, reference gathering, and what I see to be some of the most common beginner mistakes. If you're having any difficulty with Substance Painter or you just want to get some feedback, feel free to leave a comment below or consider joining my Discord server where there are plenty of people who would be willing to give you helpful advice. And the first tip I have to cover has to do with the metal edgeware. Now, if you followed any beginner Substance Painter tutorial, then you probably know that metal edgeware is a procedurally generated mask in Substance Painter. This mask generator accumulates grunge details in the areas of the crevices as dictated by your baked textures, primarily your curvature and ambient occlusion map. It has a broad array of uses when it comes to texturing, and it shouldn't be relegated to just hard surface metal objects. In weapons texturing, it's often used to blend between two materials showing where exterior wear and tear has accumulated over time. However, the main tip that I have when it comes to weapons texturing is that when you use metal edgeware, Dial it back, dial it way back. Because one of the most frequent mistakes that I see a lot of beginners make is that they instantly crank up the metal edge wear on their weapon models, thinking that they need to add a lot of details. And yet this is usually not the case. For one, a lot of metal edge wear probably doesn't make a lot of sense on a sci-fi weapon design. Also, if you look at reference of weapons that have been buried in an old battlefield and recovered a hundred years later, they still don't look as worn as the default settings in the Metal Edgeware Generator. While I use the Metal Edgeware Generator a lot and I wouldn't dissuade you from using it, I will say that its overuse and poor use has made it more easy to spot recently when it comes to video game texturing. And I think a lot of this comes from overly relying on a procedurally generated algorithm to create most of your detail on a 3D model. Which is why my next tip is to not neglect or dismiss creating manual details when it comes to weapons texturing. Sometimes beginners will become too overly reliant on only using procedurally generated textures, masks, and gradients to create their texture maps. While it's not always appropriate under all circumstances, sometimes manual painted detail is the best way to achieve the most realistic results. There are a lot of awesome tools available by default in Substance Painter for creating manual details. And while I would say it's easier to paint with a mouse as opposed to a sculpting program, this is another one of those areas where a digital arts tablet can really help. Also, a lot of beginners don't seem to realize that you can add a paint filter to a procedurally generated mask and manually paint in where you want procedural details to appear. And this is good because your main focus when it comes to weapons texturing should be just how much storytelling you can inject into your material design. Because while the 3D modeling is crucial, there is a lot that you can say about a weapon and how it was used through the texture details that you create. Things like fingerprints, scratches, dust, and dirt buildup all say a lot about a weapon and how it was used. Let's start with a few functional considerations. The magazines of your weapon will probably have a lot of wear and tear especially anywhere where it has any contact with the connections or mag well of the weapon. Also, the bottom of the mag will also have a lot of dents and wear and tear if it's been frequently dropped from the weapon. On a modern weapon, there's probably going to be a degree of scratching, scraping, or brushing between the selector switch and the receiver. This is especially true on AK models, so if you are creating an AK design with any degree of wear and tear, you better have the scrape between the selector switch and the lower receiver. Also, anywhere where there's any moving parts, any pivots, rotations, or screwed-on threads. These areas will also accumulate an appropriate amount of scratching and scraping. Also, a weapon frequently has to be cleaned and lubricated, so oil stains are not uncommon in the areas of a gas block or the bolt assembly. And this oil residue can show up in several different ways, such as just a sleek oil stain that only shows up as a specular variation on your material, 
or something more similar to Russian Cosmoline gun oil, which is more viscous and has a tendency to cake up in the various crevices inside the gun. However, a weapon that has been shot a lot will no doubt have a sprinkling of propellant powder around the area of the barrel, flash hider, and ejection port. This dusting might not be very apparent when it comes to your base color, but it will certainly dampen any specular shine in these areas. While we're talking about these texture details, it's probably also worthwhile to mention that you should do some research on the common base materials that you would use in weapon design. Standard steel milled gunmetal is pretty straightforward, but there will no doubt be a number of variations to consider between roughness, normal details, surface coatings, etc. There are a lot of different woods that can also be used on the furniture of a weapon, such as stocks and handguards. Often these wooden parts are coated in a finish or veneer that helps to seal in the wood from exposure to the elements. There are also a wide variety of polymers that are used ranging from matte to shiny, as well as some oddities such as Bakelite, a polymer resin and sort of imitation wood often used on several Russian weapons. And while all these base material considerations are important, it's also important to give your materials subtle variation as you build up layers of detail. Having looked at a lot of beginner's work, one of the parameters that I think is often getting overlooked is the specular variation, or your roughness channel. This is a texture channel where you can get a lot of details from smears, fingerprints, dusting, and it's often a good idea to include several layers of roughness variations on a weapon model design. I like to preview my texture outputs like the roughness channel from time to time, by going to the material output drop down here in the top corner of the viewport and selecting roughness. You can also cycle through your texture output channels by tapping B and then tap M to go back to the material preview shader. And the next thing I want to talk about is that filters are your friend in Substance Painter when it comes to creating good custom material design. Filters such as blur, slope blur, clamps, and warp are some of the things that I find most useful in creating custom material designs. One of the areas that I often find these filters to be most useful is achieving the difference between engraving and stamping when it comes to decals on a weapon texture. Engravings are decals, designs, text, and serial numbers that are often etched into the body of a weapon. On most modern weapons, this is done with machine precision, often by the manufacturer. However, on some weapons, such as older weapons, weapons that have been issued in military service or weapons that have been redistributed, they might have text decals or legal permit notifications that have been simply hammered on with a metal stamping kit. Either way, I'll usually start in Photoshop by creating a single image with all the decals and text that I'm going to want to imprint over my weapon design, and then I'll use that as a stencil texture in Substance Painter. Once I've used my stencil mask to apply whatever decal or text that I want, I'll then add a blur filter at a very low intensity. This will be followed by adding a levels to my texture mask, which I'll use to clamp the values range. This adds a very smooth rounded bevel to the edge of any engraved decal. However, if I'm going for more of a stamped metal decal, I might not clamp the value range as tight, and in addition to the blur node, I'll also add a slope blur at a very low intensity of something like 0.01 with an intensity divider of either 10 or 100. This just helps to add a very subtle amount of imperfection to my stamped metal decals. In fact, slope blur is a filter that I like to use a lot as I find it very useful for creating a number of different texture details such as if you use it in conjunction with a simple procedural like a black and white spots or a clouds texture, you can create some pretty convincing stippling detail on your pistol grips and handguards. Stippling is a customization that's being done to a lot of modern handguns to give them improved grip retention. But play around with filters for a while and you'll probably find some interesting applications of your own. Anywho, I hope you found some part of this video useful. If you want to see more videos on Substance Painter or you need any help or feedback with something that you're working on, feel free to leave a comment below or consider joining the Discord. Social media links in the description below. Like and subscribe.